of the Lord. We lift up praise to our King. Do you know that our God is the same? Yesterday, today, and forever. And the same God that we read about in this book, the same miracle, miracles that he performed, wonders that he did, he's still working miracles. He's still moving mountains today. And the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of David, the God of Mary, the God of these great pillars of faith that we just sang about is your God and my God. It's personal. He's not some distant, far off being, but he's near, he's close, and his presence is with us now. And for those of you who are followers of Christ, his presence lives inside of you. And we worship our God, our God. We worship him in faith. We worship him for who he is. We worship him for what he has done. He is worthy of all the praise. He's our audience today. He's the reason that we're here. And we have come to glorify the Lord. So let's give him praise one more time. Amen. 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 Come on, let's pray together. Oh, Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for being the rock that we can stand firmly on, knowing that our foundation is secure when we are standing on the rock of ages. I pray right now that you would help us to hear from your word today, the message that you have for us. I pray for my friends here in this room, pray for those watching online, that you would help us to hear what you have to say to us through your word, and that you would help, it, help us to apply your word to our life in a way that changes us from the inside out, that we may walk with you more closely, that we may follow you more nearly, and that we may live with our focus on you for the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Come on, let's give God praise one more time together. And you can be seated and it's just awesome to come together to just to simply worship the Lord. And if I haven't had the privilege of meeting you yet, my name is Pastor Doug Ingram. I am the worship ministries pastor here at Cross Point. And normally, you'll see me on the stage with my acoustic guitar or electric guitar singing and a leading worship with our band. And Pastor Paul must have been extremely desperate for speakers today because he asked me to preach in this capacity, um, which I am grateful to do. And he's actually out of town this week, but he's gonna be back here next Sunday to continue our series called Make War, looking at the story of the battle of David and Goliath and how we can apply that to our lives. But I'm here today to share with you a word from God that he put on my heart weeks ago as I was preparing for this day and planning this message and just asking God, what do you have to say to your people? And the word that kept coming back to mind, the word that I felt the Holy Spirit impress upon my heart that we need to talk about today is this word called temptation. Temptation. And at the sound of that word, I'm sure for every single one of us, a different thought comes to mind, right, as far as what temptation is. But the actual definition of temptation is the desire or the urge to do something, often that which is wrong or unwise. The urge to do something, often that which is wrong or unwise. And your temptation, the things that you are tempted with in life, might be different from the temptations that I face. But the reality is, for each and every one of us, we battle temptation. It's something that we wrestle with. It's something that we fight against. And it's something that is a struggle that is with us just because we are fallen human beings living in a sinful world. And I have three children, and all three of them, their biggest temptation, especially this time of year, coming off of Halloween is the temptation to eat too much or overeat and indulge themselves on their Halloween candy. 
My two oldest daughters are pretty decent at self-regulating themselves, but I have a son, his name is Amos, and when it comes to candy of any kind, he is like a ravaged animal, all right? (laughs) There is no holding back for him, all right? So my wife, Abby, and I, we do our best to allow him to enjoy his Halloween candy, but we try to moderate it because we know what is best for him because if he eats too much Halloween candy, he's going to what? He's going to get sick. He's not going to feel well. And we already know that that is going to happen, so we try to help make sure that he is maintaining a healthy balance of not eating too much chocolate, but just enough, right? Um, But Amos, chocolate and candy and Halloween candy, at least this past week, has been a big temptation for him. And we've had to hide that Halloween candy in places that we thought he cannot find it. So we put it on top of the refrigerator. It's in a big bag. And Amos, is, he's three years old. He's like this tall, all right? The refrigerator's way up here. So I'm like, oh, he's going to be fine. We're just going to take the risk of temptation right out from his hands and put that candy in a place where he can't get it. But if you have kids, you can probably relate to this too. If you've had small children, when it gets too quiet in your house, <laughs> you know something's up that probably shouldn't be happening. And so there's been some instances this past week where we've noticed, man, it's way too quiet in this house. Something's not right. And I will go into the kitchen, and there's Amos crawling up onto the countertop, standing up, reaching up for the Halloween candy. And as he has his hands on the candy bag, he's like, looking for mom and dad, right? And then he takes it down. And he's just sitting there with his Halloween candy, just indulging his face, hoping he can get away with as much as he can before mom and dad find out, right? And so it is not wrong for him to eat Halloween candy, but it is wrong because his mom and dad told him not to do that. And so he knows that it's wrong, yet even though his parents, who are wiser than him, well, I think so, uh, (laughs) I told him not to do that. He wants it anyway because he desires that for himself, regardless of what his authority had told him, regardless of what my wife and I had told him. He wants that Halloween candy. He's going to do whatever he can to give in to that temptation to get it, even though eating too much Halloween candy will cause negative side effects and he'll be complaining of an upset stomach and fill in the blank, right? And we laugh at a story like that. And parents, don't act like you haven't taken the Halloween candy tax off of your kids' uh, Halloween candy this past week either. But we laugh at a story like that. But often, we approach God the same way. So God has his will his way. He has declared through his word how he wants his people to live. But oftentimes, we find ourselves faced with a temptation to go against what we know God says is right to do what in our flesh we desire. And in that moment, we are saying, God, I don't want to follow you. I want what I want, and I'm going to do what I want to do because in this moment, this is what I think is best. We know that, and Pastor Paul has said this time and time again, that sin, sin is doing anything or acting in any way that is less than God's standard. It's going against God and his word. Sin takes us farther than we ever wanted to go and costs us more than we ever thought we would pay. And the act of temptation in and of itself, being tempted is not a sin. In fact, the book of James, James chapter one, says each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire, and then that desire, that temptation. When it has conceived, when it has been acted upon, it gives birth to sin. And then sin, when it is fully grown, when it is fully realized, the fullest extent of our sin leads to death. And that sounds kind of discouraging <laughs> to you. I don't know if, it, it's a, if it's just me, but my hope and my desire today is that we would hear from the word of God, specifically a story of Jesus at a time when he was tempted. And may we hear how Jesus responded to the temptation that he was confronted with by the devil. And may we 
take his response as a prescription for how we can combat temptation in our own lives. So with that, I want to encourage you right now just to turn to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 4. Uh, if you have your Bible, it's the first book in the New Testament, the first of the four Gospels. If you have your device, go ahead and fire that up. Uh, pull up your favorite Bible app or look it up on your web browser, whatever. It's also going to be on the screen too. Matthew chapter 4. Let me set the stage for what's happening here. So right before this encounter that Jesus is about to have with the devil, he was just baptized. So he was baptized by John the Baptist. His father, God Almighty, sent his, spoke to him and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And his baptism served essentially as a commissioning for the ministry that he was about to embark on in his earthly life. And Jesus was fully God. He was fully divine, but he was also fully man. Fully God and fully man. And even though God himself cannot be tempted, nor does he tempt anyone, as that passage in James talks about that I just mentioned, the human side of Jesus can be tempted, right? And so here Jesus is in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So Jesus was just baptized, and here he finds himself led up by the Spirit of God into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. In verse 2, after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. So Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights for the purpose of fasting. And he was fasting from food, from physical nourishment, so that he could grow, grow closer to the Father in prayer and seeking the will of God for the ministry that he was about to do. And it says that he was hungry. He was human. He was hungry. The fact that Jesus went 40 days without eating is very impressive. If I go 40 minutes without eating, it's going to be a problem, all right? But Jesus is here fasting for a month and a half, and he's hungry. And then what happened? Verse 3, And the tempter approached him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. So the tempter that we see later in the passage is the devil, is Satan, encounters Jesus here, and he's saying, if you're the son of God, if you have divine power, you're hungry, just tell these stones, these physical stones, to become bread, and then you can eat it, and then you can fulfill your desire for food, and then you won't be hungry anymore doesn't seem unreasonable, right? But in verse 4, he answered, It is written, man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And here's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, if I were to do this, if I were to give in to this temptation, if I were to turn these stones into bread right now, I would be going against the will of God and waiting on him to provide for my needs. He's basically saying, I'm going to take matters into my own hands, and I'm going to just perform this miracle so that I can eat, so I I can do it, so I can fulfill my human hunger while going against the will of the Father for him. And so the temptation for Jesus here was to not trust God to provide. And oftentimes we're tempted with the same thing, right? God, I don't know if you can handle this. I don't know if you're going to come through. I don't know if you're going to be faithful to me. I don't know. And then we take our life into our own hands or our matter into our own hands because we think that we trust ourselves more than, you know, we trust the Father. But Jesus says, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And here Jesus is quoting Moses from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 and 3. And Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness parallels the people of Israel, God's chosen people in the Old Testament. They're wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And God led his people through the wilderness 
to be tested, to be tried, to see where their allegiance lied, to see if they were going to be faithful to God or not. And what we see in the Old Testament in the life of Israel is their inability to remain faithful to God. But thankfully, God, in our weakness and our faithless, he is faithful and he is strong. And so Jesus here is able to do what the people of Israel, God's chosen people, were not able to do. Thus, fulfilling all righteousness as the Son of God on your behalf and mine. And so here's what Jesus says in Deuteronomy 8, 2, and 3. And you shall remember, or here's what Moses says, and you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And then Moses says, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus was more focused on fulfilling the will of God rather than fulfilling his own need for personal hunger. He was more about living for God in righteousness and being obedient to what God had called him to do rather than his own physical needs and his own physical hunger. And so the devil here is like, man, dang it. I couldn't get Jesus. I couldn't trip him up on that first one. You know, most men, if you just feed their belly, you can get, literally get them to do anything, right? Not so with Jesus, thankfully. So then the devil tried to tempt him a second way. In verse 5, Matthew 4, verse 5, Then the devil took him to the holy city, the city of Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, the highest point of the temple, which is probably about 350 to 400 feet in the air. So imagine standing on a 35-story building and looking down. And so the devil is with Jesus on the top of the temple, and he says to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. Throw yourself down. For it is written, He will give his angels concerning you, and they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. So here's Jesus standing at the top of the temple, looking down, and he's saying, just jump, just jump. If you are the son of God, if you have divine power, if you say that you trust in your father, you know that he's going to protect you. You know that he's not going to let you fall. So just jump. What's the big deal? And here the devil is essentially saying that God is only trustworthy when he comes through for us. God is only trustworthy when he saves us from calamity. But the truth is that God is trustworthy no matter what. God is trustworthy no matter what. It reminds me of an Old Testament story of three dudes named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And there's a king named Nebuchadnezzar, and he forced an encouraged his people, including these three men, to bow down and worship him. But they worshiped the Lord Almighty, Yahweh, to the point where they were put in a fiery furnace. And they said, even if, even if God doesn't rescue us from this circumstance, he is still good. He is still good. And so here, Satan was trying to tempt Jesus to force God's hand to performing a miracle to force God's hand at performing a miracle. And then Jesus responds, saying that you should not put the Lord your God to the test. Another interesting thing here is that Satan thinks he can try to beat Jesus at his own game by quoting scripture himself. He's saying, Jesus, if you're gonna defend yourself with the weapon of the word, if you're gonna defend yourself by quoting scripture against temptation, well, I'm going to use God's word against you. And so Satan took scripture, Psalm 91, 11 and 12, and manipulated it for his own purposes. And this is what Psalm 91, 11 and 12 says. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Yes, God is trustworthy. God is our shield. God is our defense. However, the sin comes when we try and act in such a way that forces God 
to show his power, that forces God to perform a miracle. It reminds me of a movie that I watched as I was a kid, the movie called Aladdin. Aladdin. So Aladdin, what did he do? He found a magic lamp, he rubbed it, Robin Williams came out in the form of a blue genie and had supernatural power. He had supernatural power, more power than Aladdin ever could have, but the genie, all power, this all-powerful genie was subservient to the person operating the lamp. And so he had to act on Aladdin's behalf however Aladdin wanted him to. So he had three wishes and the genie would just perform those wishes, perform those miracles, right? And sometimes there's a temptation to treat God the same way, to treat him like he's our genie, to treat him like he's our butler, to treat him like we're in charge and he's just here to do our bidding, right? But the truth of the matter is, God is in charge. It's God's will. It's God's way. It's God who orders everything in the universe. We are subservient to him, not the other way around. So Jesus said to him, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. You shall not act in a way to tempt God to perform a miracle. And here we see next the devil's like, man, couldn't, get, couldn't trip Jesus up a second time. Maybe I could get him with this third temptation. In verse 8, it says, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And this is what the devil said to Jesus. The audacity. Think about this. The devil says to Jesus, the Messiah, I will give you all these things. I will give you all these kingdoms. I will give you everything if you just bow down and worship me. Bow down and worship me. And we know that Jesus came as the Messiah. And we know that Jesus is the reigning king of kings. But here the devil is trying to tempt Jesus by saying, you can be the Messiah. You can be the ruler of all of these kingdoms without having to go through the agony of the cross. You can bypass all of that. You can bypass all of the suffering that you know that you're going to experience if you just bow down and worship me. But the truth is, even if Jesus was able to do that, had he done that, this is a lie from the devil. And for you and me in our own life, in a lot of times, we hear these lies from the enemy that sound good on the surface, right? They sound good. Temptation to sin seems like a fun thing oftentimes, but what we forget and what's not included with the temptation is what happens after we give in to sin and the destruction, the calamity, the heartbreak, and the sorrow that always follows sin. Because Satan, the enemy, has come, Jesus says, to steal, kill, and destroy. That is his MO for you and for me, to steal from you, to kill you, and to destroy your life. But Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. And Jesus responds to this temptation of the devil in verse 10, then Jesus said to him, Be gone, be gone, Satan. Go away, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So here we have three temptations that Jesus himself experienced. And each time Jesus' response to the temptation was to fight with the weapon of of the word and to not deviate from the path that his father had him on knowing that God's will was good knowing that God's way was best and knowing that God had a plan for him and a mission that he had ordained for him to complete and for you and me God has a purpose for our lives God has a purpose for your life and when we 
choose to go against God's plan, when we choose to ignore God's word, when we choose to live a lifestyle contrary to the way that God has intended, we are essentially saying, God, I don't want your purpose for my life. I don't want your will. I don't want your way. I want to do things my way. And like we started this talk out with, sin takes us farther than we ever wanted to go and costs us more than we ever thought we would pay. But the hope for us is that we don't have to live defeated. We don't have to live constantly giving in to temptation, constantly giving in to our own desires. Because yes, in and of our own strength, we have no power against temptation. But our power is in relying on the Spirit of God and fighting with the weapon of the Word. And so Jesus, in his humanity, he fought with the weapon of the word. He remembered what God said. And when the devil tried to tempt him with a lie, Jesus responded by proclaiming the promises of God. And for you and for me, when we are tempted, whatever that temptation might look like in your life, you have a choice. You have a choice to respond and remember the promises of God. And there's a couple scriptures here to help us apply this teaching to our lives. The first one comes from the book of James. James chapter four, verse seven. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. What happened after that last temptation that Jesus faced? He said, be gone, Satan, for it is written. Then he responded with the word of God. Worship your God and serve him only. So one of the ways that we can battle temptation and using the weapon of the word is to submit ourselves to God and to resist the devil. And then he will flee. He will flee. And so in that moment, after that third temptation in the wilderness, the devil fled. And what happened after that? It says that angels came and ministered to Jesus. And they came and ministered to his physical needs. They provided him that food that he had been longing for after fasting in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. But Jesus waited on God. He waited on the Lord. He waited and was obedient to the will of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you that is common to man. No t- you don't face any temptation that is unique to you. No temptation that you face has overtaken you that is not common to man. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear or beyond your ability. And with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may endure it. Sometimes, oftentimes, God allows us to experience trials, to experience tests, to experience temptation in our life. But he never leaves us alone. He always provides his people with a way out so that we can stand victorious on that temptation, so that we can overcome that temptation. And we don't overcome on our own ability or our own strength, but we trust in the one who did overcome, and his name is Jesus, and our faith is in him. Our our soul hope is in him. So in that middle of that temptation, know that you are not alone, but that God is with you, and there is a way out if you just call on the Lord and remember his word. In Hebrews 4, 15, speaking of Jesus, the author of Hebrews says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one, Jesus, who in every respect has been tempted just as we are. What we saw today in Matthew 4 is an account of that, yet without sin. Jesus understands Jesus knows. Jesus knows your heart. Jesus knows your pain. Jesus knows what it feels like to be tempted. For he himself experienced that himself. It reminds me of the song, Same God, that we just sang a few moments ago. Right? We serve a God that is not far off. We serve a God that is not just sitting down in heaven like, 
looking at his subjects, right? But we serve a God who is near to his people. We serve a God who can empathize, who can sympathize, who understands what it's like to live and to be human. He understands and he knows. But Jesus did what no man could ever do. Jesus never succumbed to temptation. He never succumbed to giving in to that temptation or to sinning because he was the perfect holy one who lived a sinless life. He lived the life that we could never live. And he died the death that we all deserved. The book of Philippians chapter two, one of my favorite passages of scripture talks about the humility of Jesus, that he humbled himself to the obedience of the Father. He humbled himself in obedience to the point of death, even death on a cross, not because he did anything to deserve it, but because he died for us, the people whom God loves. He humbled himself and was obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so when we are tempted to sin, when we are faced with the choice to do what we know is right, or to sin against God. May we cling to the hope that we have in Jesus. And may we say in the face of temptation, in the face of adversity, in the face of the devil, I serve the one who is high and lifted up. I serve the one who has the name above every name. I serve the one, Jesus, who every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And when we see Jesus one day, because we will come face to face with him one day, may our heart, may our attitude just simply be to fall at his feet and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for living the life that I could never live. Thank you for enduring the cross and dying the death that I deserved. Thank you for taking my place. And it is in your life, it is in your death, and it is in your resurrection that I have hope, that I have life, that I am forgiven. There's nothing we could ever do to earn the favor of God. There's nothing we could ever do to earn his love, to earn his forgiveness. He freely gives it to us and he showed his love in the most perfect way by sending this man who we spent some time talking about today by sending his son Jesus to be the savior of the world and maybe you're here today and you're saying you know I hear the truth of the word of God I hear the truth of who Jesus is and what he has done for me, but I have never put my faith in him. If that is you today, may today be the day that you ask Jesus to forgive your sin. May today be the day that you surrender to Jesus and invite him into your life and make you a new creation. Because the only hope that we have to have a relationship with God, an eternal relationship with God, it's not through our good works, it's not through our performance, it's not through our willpower. It's simply only through saying, Jesus, only you. Jesus, only you can save me. Only you can forgive my sin. Only you can cleanse me of the wrong I've done. Only you have the power to save. And if that's you today, I just invite you, just with every head bowed and every eye closed, just to come before the Lord in prayer and to pray this prayer in your heart after me.
Lord God, I am a sinner. I am in need of you. Right now, I respond to the truth of your word. I recognize that you are the Lord of all, that you are the God who saves, and that true everlasting life is only found in surrendering to the person and work of Jesus Christ and trusting him for salvation. And right now, I ask, Father, that you would forgive my sin. I surrender all I was, all I am, all that I will ever be. I ask that you would forgive me, that you would come into my life, that you would make me a new creation from the inside out and help me to live for you alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If that's you, I just want to encourage you right now, just on that connect card that my friend Jason talked with you about a few minutes ago, just to check off the box that says, I pray to receive Christ. Because we would love to know that decision that you made today so that we as a church can encourage you in your walk with God, so that we can encourage you on your journey with Jesus, that we can encourage you in your life following Jesus. Jesus. The second next step today is for us to apply this message to our life by saying, I will fight temptation with the weapon of the word. I won't try to reason with the enemy. I won't try to, I won't entertain that thought of temptation in my mind, but immediately I will recognize the temptation and choose to fight with the weapon of the word. Did you know that Ephesians chapter 2 talks about putting on the full armor of God. And with the full armor of God, there is only one offensive weapon listed in that passage. And that is the sword of the spirit. Translation, that sword of the spirit is the word of God. Knowing this word and proclaiming the word of God over our circumstances, over our situations, over our life is our number one offensive weapon that we have against the enemy. But we can't proclaim it if we don't know it. So my encouragement to you and to me is that we would seek God in his word, that we would spend time with him every day, getting to know him, knowing what his word says, knowing what the promises contained in this book are, and that we would speak the word of God over every circumstance and situation in our life, especially when we are faced with temptation. The third next step kind of coincides with that, and it says, I will combat the lies of the enemy by declaring the promises of God. I will combat the lies of the enemy by declaring the promises of his word. And may we never forget his promise. May we never forget his truth. And may we never forget his word to us. And may we proclaim that in the face of lies. The lies of culture, the lies of our society, the lies of the world, the lies that the devil tells us, and the lies that we tell ourselves. May we fight against those lies by proclaiming the promises of God. And the last next step says, I will memorize James 4, 7. I will memorize James 4, 7 that says, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That is a promise that we can hold fast today. Submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Man, it's been an honor and a privilege just to share this message with you. And we're going to have time in a moment to respond. It's all, it's all for God. It's all for God. But we're going to have time in a moment to respond to this message in worship by singing out and declaring what we declared earlier to start our service, that I won't bow down to idols. I'll stand strong and worship you so that Christ would be magnified in 
Can we all stand as we pray together? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for the gift of your word. I thank you, God, for the power that we have that comes from you to fight against the enemy. Thank you for your spirit that dwells in us. Thank you for your word that serves as a weapon against the lies of the enemy and the temptations that we face. And I pray, God, that in this moment, moving forward, that you would help us to practice this truth today. And that you would help us to remember that when we resist the devil, he will flee. I pray that you would strengthen us every day that you would help us as your people to live for you in our everyday life, knowing that our life lived for you is worship. And God, I pray that you would help us as your people to declare this week, wherever we go in the conversations that we have at home, at work, at school, wherever we find ourselves, God, help us to represent Jesus and that you would be magnified in us. We thank you, we love you, we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.